Yo, hot Iowa. Buenos dias, mi gente. Hi, Taos. Thank you for tuning in to our series, In the Valle, Prejudice and Reconciliation in Taos. We're here today with Mr. Larry Torres at his fine, fine, fine home here in the Royal Circle. And, uh, well, uh, we're going to jump right into things with Mr. Torres. And, Mr. Torres, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being here. Uh, a little bit of background about yourself, just in case anybody out there hasn't met you. Absolutely. <laughs> My name is Larry Torres. I'm from Arroyo Seco, New Mexico, right here where I'm sitting right here. This is where I used to herd sheep and cows when I was little. But uh, after I gave up the farm life, I started teaching, and I've been teaching for 43 years. I was retired from UNM Taos on uh, last June, so a little over a year. And uh, since then, I've just been trying to take it easy and get some notes together, clean up the house a little, because it suffers a lot when you're teaching full-time. But love to be here with you, uh, Juan. Thank you for, for inviting me, and thank you for your patience, because sometimes I'm a little, I'm a little bit squirrely and I forget things. <laughs> That's okay, Mr. That's okay. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. So, uh, we're just going to get right into the, the questioning. Absolutely. Because, um, uh, like, like I said, you know, we're just having these conversations about uh, prejudice and reconciliation, yes, you know, what we can do to to keep our home the wholesome community that it always has been. So, uh, my first question to you, sir, is, does Taos suffer from systemic racism? Systemic racism is a big term, but yes, it does. And the way that I would define systemic racism is that we live in a place called Taos, in which we suffer from what is called clannishness. It's called compadrismo, where somebody's your compadre, you know, and if you're related to that person, then you're probably likely to vote for that person when he or she runs for office. It doesn't matter whether they are qualified or not. The whole point is you're getting your primos, your primas, your tios, your tias, everybody to vote for you. And so, yes, there is a kind of prejudice. It's not so much about who knows what that gets you elected here in Taos, but whom you know that gets you elected. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is that kind of uh, uh, systemic racism. To that, I would also add we have what is called geographic racism. Geographic racism means that even though we, some areas of this area have zoning laws and some do not, sometimes you can see a big mansion next to a trader home, but the whole point to remember is this. We build and we live according to what we can afford. And when we can't afford, then we live, leave it for a little while. I think I was saying one time that uh, it's really interesting for me to see these beautiful, beautiful homes that are completely unfinished, unstuckled, unpainted outside. And part of that is because we know that here in Taos County, that if we do not paint a house or have it stuck with outside, we can always claim that it is still in the making, it is still a work in progress, and therefore it is not as taxable on a high bracket as it would be otherwise. So that's another way in which systemic racism and uh, geographical racism are, are here. Also, we know that here in Taos, we are divided into little neighborhoods. Every little neighborhood has its place of origin and its point of origin and its proper way of being called. But besides this, we also have what we call surnames for, or, or maybe, uh, sobriquet, what do you say that in French? Uh, uh, nicknames, nicknames for, for people. For example, we can say that we have, oh, across the way there are the Chaquewe eaters, the Chacaueros, those would be the the cornmeal mush eaters, I think you might know. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. That would not be us. That would be us there across the, <laughs> across the fence line there at the Pueblo. And, and they're exactly necessarily... right about, a way, about a mile and a half that way, yes. straight, straight from here. And that's, that's not a bad thing either. I mean, I, I, would never, I would probably never take offense to that kind of a nickname because uh -huh. I love my atole. Of course. And I know I'm not the only one at the Pueblo that loves their chia. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's like... It's, it's like the breakfast of champions. Of course it is the breakfast <laughs> of champions. Other places, like for example, you can say that the people of Canyon tend to have a darker skin color than the rest of us, so they might be called the crow people, los cuervos, for example. Uh, some people from, uh, from uh, ranchos de Taos would be called the, the grangolinos. Grangolinos means that they are the people who are afraid of the dark, especially of going out after dark, after sunset because too many people might be around and uh, not enough lighting. So as you see, yes, there's all kinds of prejudice. Sometimes it just uh, hinted at bigotry, but yeah, it's still there one way or another. Mm. I, I like the way you put that, especially with the, uh, the geographical stuff there, because 
I never, I mean, you drive around towns and you see it all the time. Oh, yes. Really fancy, nice casita. The, 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 the vigas are nice and painted or, or they're lacquered real nice. And oh. they have the blue trim around the doors and the windows. Oh, the yeah. stucco is very fine. And then right next door, there's one and it's, you can see the chicken wire. Yes. And I never, I had always, and, and, and see, this is a sign of my own ingrained prejudice. I was always thinking, oh, well, they must be lazy. Uh -huh. You know, and all this time. No, it's because they'd end up putting themselves into a higher tax bracket exactly. and possibly not even afford the home anymore. You got it. Wow, that's... I never looked at that one before. Yeah, well... Especially it, in that kind of perspective. It comes in different ways, forms, and sizes. As I said, I've been teaching for 43 years, and the whole point is to remember is that we are all children of the same soil. And, you know, sometimes we get caught up in... What color is your skin, or what's your tax bracket, or where do you live, geographically speaking, vis-a-vis -vis everybody else? That's not important. The whole point is we are all family, and that's what we have to promote more than anything else. We are family. I agree with that. I have primos right here in Seco, like the Cordovas oh, and, yeah. and, and uh, Felipe Flip Medina. Uh -huh. You know, he's, he's he's not living in town anymore, but he's still he's still considered a cousin. Of course, the primo and. Um, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, the same soil, because even in my own conversations with my own peers and my own friends, you know, I always would make it a point to say, well, you know, San Francisco de Assisi and St. Jerome, they're made out of the same dirt. You got it. So, yeah. You got it. And the other thing that I should point out to you, Juan, is that when we study last names here in New Mexico, it's fascinating to see, because you know that when the first conquistadores came over here in 15, 1541, there were already 12 different tribes, 12 different language groups in New Mexico. And then they added a whole bunch of other languages here. Just Spanish? No, not at all. Even though they had come with us because of the, they were funded by the Spanish tribe, when you look out of the 364 men and women who came to New Mexico, out of 364 men, 227 weren't even Spanish. There were Greeks, there were Portuguese, there were Italians. There were Arabs, there were Jews, there was even one Scotsman listed at the expedition. And then you combine these with all the native tribes already here, and then they start intermarrying each other, so that just 150 years later, by 1770, my goodness, there were more people of mixed blood, what we call the Indo-Hispanos, here in northern New Mexico especially, than there were people who were totally purely native or totally purely European, for example. If I read across somebody whose last name was uh, was uh, Medina or or Salazar, would you see Spanish? Spanish, yes. I'd say no, no, Arabic. And if I read it to somebody who like the Espinosas down the road, who are a very Catholic family, say Spanish, Catholic, no, Jews, crypto Jews. So it's fascinating to see. Even my own people, for example, um, I am a, 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 the Medina clan. So when people look at the windows that I have in my house, for example, they say, oh, this is very Russian. And I said it was, but it didn't start out there. It came from a little place called Byzant Byzantium, which was an Arab state before right, it was yeah. anything else. So yes, we have the ball here. The Marcus clan, no, those are the Marquis class. And they were French originally. The Gurules, no, they were Grole, also French. Whoa. Then is there something that's truly triculture in New Mexico? I see it starts out as triculture, but guys, if you really start digging into the past, into our last names, heavens, you're going to find out that we are multiracial, multiethnic, and we should be proud. Build on our differences rather than let our differences separate all of us. Yes, that's great. That's great. Moving along, um, what, if any, forms of racism or prejudice have you experienced here in Taos? Well, I'm an old man. That's, that's quite an order, uh, an order. But no, I remember I was growing up here in the 50s and 60s, and the biggest form of racism in those days was the anti-hippie movement. I remember when we were told that a bunch of long-haired people who dressed really funny and who spoke pot and who said, hey, hell no, we won't go, in, in reference to the Vietnam War during those days, we're coming to town. Oh, I remember people even praying, deliver us from the hippies. We didn't know what a hippie was. I go again, we find out later on that they're just as much people as we are over here. But in those days, we thought if they look different, if they act differently, if they smoke differently than from, we are, from what we do over here, they must be not welcome. 
But guess what? 56 years later, now their children are in school. The children of the flower children and the grandchildren of the flower children are all part of her school system. And they are just as much, for better or worse, they are better. They are part of who we are in Taos, New Mexico. So yes, sometimes those people that you see as your enemy or those people that you see as different from you, if you live long enough, you're going to realize, oh, they're just people like the rest of us and it's okay to accept all of them. And yes, the Vietnam War is over, it went on, and uh, we didn't have to blame anybody because all things pass. The Bible says to everything there is a season and a th time for everything under heaven. So all those signs that we had in those days, no, su no shirt, no shoes, no service, no, it's okay. It's okay, we're not judging you based on your, on your socioeconomic status at all. It's just who you happen to be and who I happen to be. Right. Strong words there. And the hippie community does add a certain kind of dynamic to Taos. Yes. That is very different from, I would imagine, other hippies in other parts of the world. I think so. Because it, pro and it probably has a lot to do with the fact of our complicated history and past. Don't you right on. And, and what's going to be fascinating, and I'm kind of anticipating your next question about the BLM movement. Ah. Because I was, when I saw that there was a sit-in, actually a lying, and I can't breathe movement, just about three weeks ago in Taos. And when you look, and if you scan the people who are in the streets, not just the hippies, the Chicanos, the Anglos, the tourists, old people, young people, everybody who's united together into the I do not, I can't breathe movement. And I say, I love this, if only because it reminds us all, guys, Get That's together, right. come together, unite. That's right, even some of our own tribal members were there for that event. So that was awesome. And so having anticipated that, do you see any reflections of the past in the current state of civil unrest with the Black Lives Matter movement? Oh, heavens. So long as, whenever you have two cultures or more that come together, you have some kind of conflict from at the beginning. For example, I'm thinking since I'm a history teacher, I remember the time when the Romans ruled the world. But everyone who was not Roman was called a barbarian, or that is, a bearded person. In those days, by that, by that definition, I am not a Roman, for example, even though Valassi is Torres, which incidentally is Jewish more than anything else. But, what, but what's really interesting is the Romans would grab the people and clobber them, and, and that's how they fought, fight the barbarians in battle. So one of the rules to become a Roman citizen was, you must be clean-shaven at all times. So every two, three days, your slave would come behind you and shave you completely from head to bottom if you were a true Roman person, do you see? Mm -hmm. Later on, those kinds of things happen to, be, to, to pass on to other civilizations. For example, we've all read the stories. I remember you were telling me that Annie McDonald was your teacher. You probably, she probably talked to you guys about the Iliad and the Odyssey and the, the war to, to rescue the beautiful Helen of Troy. Suddenly we realize after all these years, it wasn't the war to rescue lady. It was an ideology against another ideology. It was East versus West. West versus East. My gods versus your gods. And tell me, isn't that what we're fighting in the Middle East still? When we talk about this, you know, we have a Christian, Judeo-Christian dynamic, which is all our military here, but they have a nice Muslim force on the other side, which is just as important to them and they're willing to fight for it. So we have to realize that also religion tries to unite people does it always succeed? Sometimes it just helps to unite, to, to, to divide people. We have to remember people like Hitler, who happened to come by. What did Mr. Hitler do way back during the World War II? He says, the Nordic tribes, those are the ones who are superior to everybody else. You Europeans that come from the Mediterranean side, no, that is not there. So when you're asking me, Juan, that if, if we have precedents in history, yes, Every so often there is a cycle, the presidents come over and you realize that it'll take people who are even more unpopular today, such as Mr. Abraham Lincoln, who came up with the Emancipation Proclamation, and yet we want to tear down his statue for heaven's sakes. How far do we have to go? Or how far does one have to sacrifice and give up his own rights just so that others may live? Yes, the BLM movement is very, movement is very, very important. But I'm telling you, it's not in the first and it won't be in the last because we're human, which means we're perfect. That's right. Man, you're blowing my mind now, Mr. Torres, because <laughs> man, oh man, it's uh, when, I, when, I, when I ask of, you know, 
reflections of the past, I'm, my mind immediately goes to civil rights movements, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, those kind of things. But you bring it to a light to where it's a it's it's not it's not such a small little spotlight on one little thing, one little event, one little time in history. But you brought in that scope of that light to show that this has happened so many so many times so in, many in our times, like so in our times. in our genetic history. Mm -hmm. And it may I say also from from a personal point of view, I taught Russian language for a quarter of a century in Memphis, Tennessee, where every all my students were black. I said, "Eighty, it put me in contact with the culture that I never would have gotten to know and know well if I hadn't been there for a quarter of a century." That's where I learned that Mr. Martin Luther King was assassinated just down the road from me in Beale Street at the Lorraine Motel. That's where I found out that the people over there they eat different things. I learned to eat collard greens. I learned to eat hominy grits. The things that I had no idea were here would have been here in Dallas, New Mexico, but I did over there and. Uh, and that's, that's how you start getting over prejudice, by breaking bread with one another. Yeah, I was going to say, like saving a, sharing a meal, man. <laughs> that's the way to do it. We don't yes. love food, man. All right, so um, in your opinion, how well has President Trump responded to the current situation with the PLM? Well, God bless him, he's trying. I know he's trying, but he's a frightened man. Sometimes I just want to go give him a hug and say, it's okay. We're all frightened. Let's be frightened together. Because if we're all frightened together, then we will have strength in numbers instead of trying to say, I'm the boss, you're not. I'm going to do it, you're not. And, of course, we have to remember that whenever the media enters a picture, you have a third element that enters, and that also causes a little bit of friction uh, to, to be developed. But, no, we, can't, we say sometimes in Spanish, No puedes repicar la campana y andar... In a procesión de la misma vez. That means you can't ring the bell and be in the procession at the same time. That means that you can't do things and do a good job. You can't serve two masters because you will serve one better and not the other one. So just serve one master at a time and you should be, do fine. Wow, that's, um, that's a very different opinion from, from what I've heard from other people that we've interviewed so far. Um, most opinions fall for, to either the very one side extreme to the very other. You either love them or you hate them kind of thing, you know? And uh, for you to offer that kind of pers perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's very humbling. Well, because I, I know that you're a man of the church. And I, not being so religious, very spiritual, but not so religious would never think to extend the olive branch. I think it's very important, one that we all do. Because in this day and age, everybody wants justice. You did this to my people, therefore I demand justice and retribution of some sort. No, we did those to that. And as I said, that's all part of who we are as humans. We do that to one another. Now I'm saying to, uh, to expect in the olive branch is not just asking for justice, but for mercy also. None of us were there in the past when the, those atrocities were committed. Therefore, how can we answer, be answerable to them when we weren't there? Mercy is the second equation of the, of the, of the, the formula for how do you find peace in the world? Justice, absolutely. Also work for mercy. Yes, yes. I think that's what we're trying to do here. I mean, I, these, these conversations is just to bring light to those situations that, that have occurred in our past that kind of leave us scathed and, and, and a little wounded. Yes. And it's time we heal those, so. Yes. yes. And, and may, I add, may I add a third part to the equation? This is just, besides justice and mercy, education. If you do not teach your past, you're going to keep repeating the same things. My old friend uh, Winston Churchill used to say, people who do not remember their past are condemned to repeat it again. Don't repeat it again, people. It was hard enough the first time. Let's move forward. Be educated. Right, right. So we, we talked about this earlier, and um, we, you kind of touched on it with the whole thing with the um, uh, people wanting to take down statues of, of Lincoln. Yes. I can understand why certain particular tribes would want to see those kind of monuments taken down, mm -hmm. uh, particularly because of the hanging of the Dakota 38. Oh, yes. 
But I would think for myself that, you know, maybe it'd be best to just remind people that that did occur. It, it's so obscure. You, you, it's not something they teach in the high school textbooks. No, it really is. So, yeah, so, so my question is, you know, groups of people across the United States are calling for the removal of statues depicting certain historical figures. Mm -hmm. Here in New Mexico, uh, figures such as Juan de Oñate, uh, even right there on our own plaza, uh, Padre Martinez, the removal of Kit Carson's name from the park, just a little, bring it a little closer to home. What do you feel is the best route to meet those demands? Again, the whole point is to remember that we are men and women of our times, and we tend to act as men and women of our times. We look back at, for example, the atrocities, and they were, I'm not denying, that, Ms. that Don Oñate, that second governor of New Mexico did, but he, when, when he cut off the foot of a lot of people, that was awful, but would getting rid of his statue help any? It won't change the past. It, in fact, it may inflame the present much more, because if we just get rid of a statue without explaining why you are getting rid of the statue, then we're no better than those people from the past. One day people are going to look back in the year 2000, 2000, 20, 20, 2020, and they're going to say, good heavens, those people of Taos, New Mexico, see what they were doing. And we think we're so advanced. Think to the future, guys. Quit looking so much into the past as how your actions lay yesterday and your actions today will affect your actions tomorrow. Father Martinez of Taos, love him dearly, but when I look at him from, an, from, a, from the bishop's point of view, for example, from Jean-Baptiste Lavi, the first Archbishop of Mexico's point of view, absolutely I could see why he hated him. In fact, even the last Archbishop of Santa Fe, well, that statue was dedicated at Taos Plaza, wrote a note that says he would not be there to bless the statue. And I thought, good heavens, that conflict between Lavi and Martinez occurred over 150 years ago, and we still haven't forgot, forgiven I'm sure we, keep, we won't forget, but forgiveness is part. You can't move forward without forgiveness. So look at it. We're already talking justice, we're talking mercy, we're talking education, and we're talking forgiveness. Get over it, people. It's very important that we move forward. Otherwise, what are we going to do otherwise? I, we, we tend to say that when we get rid of a statue, it's really death by proxy. You're not really kill, killing the person or the memory of the person. You're just killing it in your own mind. But it's important to see that when we do things like this, we are not really doing something to educate our future, our children, our parent children, or our present children. In fact, we can tend to say that children are, are our future, and I say no, children are our present. Be careful. Hmm. Could you elaborate on that idea a little bit? Sure. We can tend to think that the children are, have brains that are being formed in the present, but what I'm saying, no, children are already here. They're doing it in a different reality. It's very important to recognize, especially in a place as dynamic and as diverse as Taos, is that reality has different forms. The reality that I'm speaking about is that multiple perspectives tend to yield multiple realities. If you only have one way of looking at the world, that's the only way you're going to judge the world. If you have two different realities, such as being bilingual, or trilingual, or quadrilingual, whatever it happens to be, you're going to have different ways of looking at the world and understanding it. Does that mean that you are asked to give up your own reality? Not at all. It's just to say, it may not be my reality, but it is certainly somebody else's reality, and that person is just as important as I consider myself to be on this plot of land, because we share the same soil. Love it. Absolutely love it. Okay. And the reason I asked you to elaborate on it is because... Recently, I've, um, you know, I, I, I consider myself still a child. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm a grown man with children and a wife and, 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 a, and a home to take care of and look after. But I'm still a child of, the, of, of, of humanity and, and the earth and the world and trying to better myself. So I went back to school. Now, I had caught some, folks, me, I had caught some flack from a tribal member or two in regards to pursuing a college education as opposed to pursuing my traditions and language further. But I'm glad you brought that up because I too, in a way, felt the same way. Like, 
No, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a little bit of a different perspective to our own reality, our own way of life at Taos Pueblo, Good for you. and Good for you. possibly make life better for, the, for our tribe in the long run. So I'm, I'm glad you said that. I, I think um, in my own personal world, in my own personal life, in my own reality, I, I think I needed to hear that. And what I need to add this to it, because I see the joy that you have in trying to promote peace and understanding among all the people at Taos. And that's a big dragon that you're trying to fight. But that's also important to realize that what you said, he said, I'm still a child. I'm a man, but I'm still a child. And you will, as long as you're always a child, you'll still keep learning. That's why I taught. Not so much because I wanted to teach, but I wanted to keep learning. It kept me as a child for 43 years, and I loved it more than anything else. The other thing I'm going to tell you, one, the minute you stop learning how to play, you begin to die. Never <laughs> stop learning how to play. Play, uh, even if it's plays of words, or plays of, uh, of making fun of, of things. Sometimes it's easier to smile and to laugh than to cry. Well, I don't know. My kids had me on the floor the other day building <laughs> Lego houses. And when I tried to get up from the floor, I heard something pop, man. <laughs> but it's an was, old child. That was fun. It's still an old child. But it was fun. Okay, so um, uh, getting back to, the, to, to our, our conversation, mm -hmm. um, what solutions would you like to see implemented to heal the ancestral trauma minority groups suffer, not only throughout the country, but also here in our own community? What I would say to that question is that sometimes when we raise people to the status of child uh, of hero worship or make institution out of somebody, we forget that they were just as flawed human beings as we are, as imperfect as we are in their own time. And if they had lived in this time, they would have been just as flawed. Or maybe they would have brought enlightenment to us. But the whole point is the human animal, and we are human animals, tend to be in a constant state of flux. From the moment that you're born to the time that you're dead, and even a little beyond, you're gonna find out that we are in a state of flux. The reality that we have when we're a child, it develops as, we, as our learning develops a little bit more. And sometimes they may go back and say, okay, I didn't get that right. Maybe I'll go back and recapture that moment and teach it to my children and my great-grandchildren uh, thereafter. But that's what I would say. Just forget about making people into institutions and into, into children, or into, 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 uh, into institutions or, or, or hero worship people because we are imperfect. Are we apologizing for it? No. As I said, just be glad that you're human and that you're here and enjoy the beautiful freshness of the year today, the colors outside, the soft breeze that's wafting through the house right now, the smells coming from the kitchen. Live in the moment is what I'm saying. Don't live for a moment that may never come, because it may not be your time. What I said to you one time, I think one, was that unless the genius of the man, that is the genius of the person, meets the genius of the moment, everything goes awry. Because if the person is ready, but the moment is not ready, then you'll come off as a madman. But if the moment is ready, but there's no one to take up the gauntlet and run with it, you're going to find out, I, we are lost in a world. So ask for that Pray for that. Seek that in our lives. The genius of the man and the genius of the moon. But I'm telling you, one, you're an important part of history, just important as those people who gave before you, because as long as, long as you remember that you are a part of history right now, you can change it and help those change it also. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I remember when you told me that, and I had been dwelling on it for some time, for the last few days, and... and, and it kept coming back up in my mind. The genius of the man has to meet the genius of the time. And I remember those years in high school. You remember all those poetry slams and oh, all the yes, words, man, all the work Love I did. It. And that was my that was my genius at that moment. Yes. But you're right. It wasn't the right time. And it frustrated me that there I was rattling the cage, and I couldn't get hardly anybody to to, to back it up. Uh -huh. and, and to, to follow suit or, 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 or to join the bandwagon. Yes. And then a lot of stuff started happening in, in Native American civil rights, and I saw a lot of my people rise to the occasion for those particular moments, and I think I in turn frustrated them because I was tired already mm -hmm. from the fight. Yes. And then 
now I feel like I've reached a point in my life where maybe my genius can be appreciated again. And I hate to say that because it sounds like I'm bragging, but maybe maybe this is the work I needed to do. Exactly. But this is the time to do it. Exactly. So the yeah. genius at the moment had to come before that genius in the person could emerge. And that's good too. Right. But they're not always there at the same time. As I started to say earlier, to everything there's a time and a purpose to everything under heaven. And so we have to wait until the moment is ready. And somehow you'll feel it. It's not something that lets you like a bolt out of the blue. It'll be, it'll be just a little whisper coming in your ear and say, the time is now. That's what I feel like. That's what I feel like. So, um... One last question, and we're going to kind of put these together. You know, there, there's the, the we've, we've talked about it already. How does one honor the suffering of the oppressed while preserving history? But in particular, what steps does Taos need to do? What steps does Taos need to take in order to protect its most unique quality, its, its cultural diversity? We have to learn to respect one another. Ooh, is that the fifth point now? Let me see. We already had justice, we had mercy, we had education. What was the next one? And then there is... Forgiveness. I'm sorry? Forgiveness. Forgiveness, and now we say respect. Look at all the elements that went up, just to try to answer that one question uh, that you put to me. And I think, wow, look at that. Respect one another and temper it with just, temper your justice with mercy. Uh, my friend uh, William Shakespeare used to say, the quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven to the place beneath. It is twice, twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. Him that takes and him that gives. And so that's what we have to teach to everybody else. Uh, do not dis disregard, discard mercy as a solution to our imperfect wants or our needs because it is part of who we are. Appreciate, enjoy, love. Oh, there's the one that nobody ever thinks about either. Love one another, and I'm not just saying physical love, I'm saying spiritual love. As you said, you may be religious, but I'm spiritual, and no, they're not opposite, uh, they're not opposite uh, points of view. They are just different, two different solutions to where we happen to be, stand on the spectrum of human life, of humanity right now. So, temper your temper justice with mercy through forgiveness. Yes, sir. And respect. And respect. And so that way you can love and, your fellow man? You got it. So it's, so it's much more than just tolerating. It's loving. Love your enemy. As, as the, the, the holy masters used to say one time. Just love your enemy. Because if you just love your friends and, and, and hate your enemies, then what, what, what are you doing to anybody? Heck, even those who have no faith or religion can do that. No, love even, or maybe especially, those who hurt you the most. It's not an easy thing to, to do, and uh, not everybody can do it, and maybe not even in one lifetime, but if you at least have that idea in your head, then you can teach that to the next generation coming up to take over the presence. Wow. I want to, I want to strike the chord with me because, well, because of some of the things that I've been going through in my own personal life. Okay. You know, um, um, we won't get into it now, folks. We'll save the drama. <laughs> but... Um, uh, justice tempered by mercy through forgiveness and respect so that I could love my enemy you got it it's, and teach uh, it to everybody else education yes it's it really hits hard man cause I got a lot of forgiving to do the most important thing one is to forgive yourself first and to love yourself first. Because if I cannot forgive myself first and love myself first, I'm not ready to hand it out to everybody else just because I have a voice or a, an outlet. No. It starts, as, as charity, it starts at home. Uh, all right, I like that. Do you have any other words you'd like to share with the community in, in regards to any of this or all of this? And, or Not really, but I just want to say that I don't always accept interviews so when you asked me, I thought, this is somebody who has something very important to bring to the foreground. And if I can help boost it a little bit along the way and help him along the way, it's very, very important. And besides that one, by far, this is one of the best things that I've done. I've 
really enjoy being with you here. And when, <laughs> when I saw you walking around my, my house saying, Where did I, what did I come to? Oh my goodness. It's a little bit weird. Yeah, it's okay to be weird once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Your house is tremendous. I, I, I expected no less from, from, from the uh, uh, <laughs> unparalleled Mr. Lenny Toys. Oh, heavens. Don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> Don't stop. Oh, Don't goodness. stop. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, thank you again so much for, for sharing your wisdom you and your want. experience with us. Um, I hope that uh, if, if, uh, if, if we extend the series or, or the project further, that you might be available again in the future for us. I'll do whatever I can to help you. Thank you, sir. Thank because you, sir. What you're doing is very important. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I hope so. I, I hope you all out there watching agree with Mr. Torres. And, and um, I know that this series will probably not please everyone. It's okay. But, uh, but that's, you're right. That's okay. And, and um, thank you for helping us along with this and, and, and offering your, 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 your wisdom and, 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 again, your experience. I, I, it's, it's value. And thank you. My pleasure. And you're always welcome here. Thank you, Mr. Toilets. <laughs>